Hi, good afternoon, everybody. I'd like to welcome you to today's uh, monthly November meeting of the San Francisco Tech Council. My name is Andrew Broderick, and together with my colleague, Carla Sumala, we are project co-directors for the San Francisco Tech Council. And that means we are the primary contacts for anything related to the daily activities of the Tech Council. And so please do feel free to reach out to us directly if you have questions or want additional information. I will put our contact information in the chat box. And just a quick introduction for those of you who are new to the Tech Council. We are a multi-sector initiative uh, by bringing government, business, nonprofit, and consumer collaboration to advance digital inclusion here in San Francisco for seniors and adults with disabilities. And um, we were launched in 2015. And our mission is driven by this core belief that the most effective way to address all the complexities of connecting San Franciscans requires sectors working together and in partnership to do that. And so the Tech Council does serve as that community table around which all the different sectoral partners sit and discuss and explore opportunities for partnership. And that brings us to today's uh, agenda. Uh, where I'm going to hand over to Anne Hinton, who serves on our steering committee and has been a longtime member since the uh, early days of the Tech Council, and she will facilitate today's session. So, Anne, over to you. Thanks, Andrew. Um, so, as you can see from the agenda's title, um, Advancing Health Equity Through Digital Conclusion, the Council itself has been very focused for the last, well, since actually, I think, since COVID, but before that as well, on how to um, pull together the, these different arenas, right? Um, technology, health, and how to make uh, things like health, although we have interests in other areas as well, but certainly how, to, how do you make uh, healthcare um, accessible to people who are now in the situation with COVID? And one of the things that we've been investigating, because Andrew said a little bit about what he and Carla do, but one of the other things they do is the serious business of researching and investigating all the possible things that we might, uh, as a group, need to know about and discuss. In the process of all that, um, we really realized that we needed to talk to some more community folks who were doing work in the field. And so today we're going to start with Renika Butler, who is with the um, Bayview Hunters Point Senior Services. She specifically is with the Adult Day Health Center. Um, and for those of you that haven't had the privilege to uh, visit the site, um, when COVID's over, you should take, uh, take a trip and um, schedule yourself in to see what goes on. Because this is a, a multi-service agency that serve, has been in the community for many, many years, uh, serving, you know, as it started in its beginnings, African-American older adults, but now serves uh, people of other cultures as well. Um, it has long standing in the community. It has done remarkable things at a time when people said it couldn't be done. Uh, thank you so much uh, for the introduction. I'm very happy to be joining you all today. And uh, thank you, uh, Carla, again, for helping me run the uh, PowerPoint. Um, so we can uh, move on to the next slide. And I'll just kind of jump right in and share uh, what's been happening for us over the last eight or so months uh, since COVID uh, shelter in place orders began. Um, so um, yes, I, I'm here at the uh, Adult Day Health Center in Bayview. And we actually suspended our uh, in-center operations on March 17th. Um, we were not able to uh, serve any of our participants in the congregate setting um, uh, beginning on that day. Um, and prior to uh, closing our center, we had sort of spent the week before um, in anticipation of shelter in place orders, sort of planning uh, what we would do um, when the center closed. So on March 18th, we were actually able to sort of immediately transition into our COVID-19 operations, um, where we began providing our RN home visits to some of our participants. Uh, we began uh, meal deliveries five days per week, and then we also started our telehealth calls. And through the uh, initial transition process, uh, we did notice right away that 
our center participants, like all of us, were very fearful of what was happening with all of the shelter in place orders, uh, the stress and anxiety uh, was very high for both the participants and staff um, and families and caregivers of the participants were all very concerned. And we also noticed um, immediate deconditioning and decline in functional status within the first couple of weeks of shelter in place. Um, our participants weren't really following their medication regimen. Uh, they weren't really getting up for the day. They didn't really feel that they had a need uh, to get up or get dressed. Um, we noticed that our participants were falling more frequently at home and were also expressing uh, more feelings of depression and loneliness. Um, and caregiver fatigue and stress spiked up as Adult Day Health Center um, was their main form of respite care. So although uh, meal delivery uh, in its most practical form is being done to ensure uh, participants receive um, the hot and nutritious meals. And I, uh, I see Brittany's on here today. I remember she was uh, working with us as well in the beginning of shelter in place with meal delivery. Um, so even though we were, our, our main focus was to make sure our seniors were receiving uh, hot meals and um, getting those delivered to their homes uh, because they would have been receiving them here at the center. Um, it also helped us to be able to see our participants um, every day. And it also gave of them something to look forward to, um, something to get up for. It helped them stay connected uh, to the center. Um, it helps it helps them still to stay connect, uh, connected to us and um, to continue to receive that personal human contact as much as possible. Um, and we're, we're still doing them uh, today as well, meal deliveries and takeout. Uh, so while it is true that our uh, frail and vulnerable seniors living with multiple chronic health conditions are the most at risk for COVID. Uh, they are also disproportionately at risk for loneliness and isolation um, and tend to seep into depressive symptoms a lot quicker than you know, the average person. So it was important for our activity director to continue exploring ways to keep as much of the engagement through activities going as possible um, so that participants could feel some sense of being familiar with the center and staying connected to staff um, that they were interacting with the most when they were at the center. And since we couldn't uh, have our monthly birthday celebrations, um, our staff, as you can see pictured here, created signs and posters and drove to participants' homes to drop them off. Um, and we also do distance projects together outside the participants' homes when we're able to do that. And you'll see a picture on the next slide of uh, one of those other distance activities at another uh, participant's home where we did a Mother's Day project um, with him. Uh, so one of the really great things that helped us to strengthen um, our ability to provide telehealth services were grand pads. And I know some of you might be familiar with grand pads. Um, our medical director is Dr. Carla Prisinotto and she's a geriatrician at UCSF and she actually introduced us to grand pads um, as they actually use them for their own patients. Um, in the beginning of the shelter in place order, she loaned us six grand pads. And once we learned how they worked and we were able to teach our participants how to use them, we ended up purchasing uh, 20 more devices through grant funds that our executive director, Kathy Davis, who many of you know, um, was actually able to secure. Uh, so grand pads, for those who aren't familiar, they're essentially, um, very similar to smart tablets like an Apple iPad or an Amazon Fire or Android, um, except it is specifically designed to be used for and by seniors um, and they're extremely user friendly. Um, and what is actually helpful uh, to us is being able to work with GrandPad and have access to their customer support. Uh, GrandPad actually sets up each device and then they mail them to us. Um, and then all we have to do is log into our own organization specific GrandPad web portal. Uh, we assign each device to a participant and then we drop it off to them. And then we do a brief sort of how-to tutorial with our participants at their doorstep. And then GrandPad also follows up with them to schedule a more in-depth overview of the device and explains their direct access to customer support. And we actually pay um, an annual amount uh, for each device and also the cellular service so that participants can essentially use the grand pads 
um, like a cell phone, and they don't really have to depend on a Wi-Fi connection. So the approximate cost for uh, one grant pad for one year is about $1,025. Um, and we have about 26 right now. We're, we're actually going to order just uh, about five or six more. So pictured here on the slide is one of our center nurses uh, on a grant pad video call with uh, one of our participants who is showing the nurse her medication bottles and also pointing out the areas of her body where she's experiencing pain. And she's able to do that from the safety of her home while she sits on her on her bed. Um, and you might be able to see uh, Miss Alice on the on the um, laptop there. And just like many of our participants, she really misses being physically at the center. Um, but she's been very excited and happy about being able to use uh, the grand pad. And um, she actually wants to figure out a way to get her own so that she can keep it when she's not. Um, with the center anymore as she is moving soon. Um, we've also been able to work with GrandPad to set up peer-to-peer -peer video calls. So all of our participants who have a GrandPad can actually talk to each other. They can call each other and have video calls. Um, and it's actually been really fun to see them quickly learn uh, how to use the technology and also sort of um, teach them how to have video uh, etiquette over the, over the GrandPads. Um, so some of the apps on the device that are popular for our center um, are music, of course. There's many different genres of music that they can choose from. Um, games like bingo is really popular as it was in the center and also things like blackjack. And then surfing the web um, is highly used and we are able to get all that information from Grand Pat as they're able to track that and create, um, collect the data for us. And we actually noticed a big spike in um, web surfing during the month of October. And I was probably, uh, I was wondering if that was probably due to uh, the election. Um, and then also GrandPad is able to, or was able to install Zoom on the devices. So um, some of our participants have actually been able to do uh, Zoom calls with their primary care providers. Um, and then we're hoping to be able to start running group Zoom um, activities. Um, we haven't exactly been able to teach all of our participants how to enter in a meeting ID or click the link for the Zoom call, but we're actually working on, on doing that. Um, can we go to the next slide, please? Um, and then for our greater organization um, of Baby Senior Services, we actually just received some pretty exciting news um, from our partnership with the uh, San Francisco Department of Technology. So again, our executive director, um, Kathy, was able to meet with the Department of Technology and uh, come up with a plan to provide free Wi-Fi to every resident who is living in the Dr. George W. Davis Senior Residence. Um, which is actually located just down the street about a mile away from the Adult Day Health Center where I am. Um, so this free Wi-Fi will actually allow uh, residents in the building to be able to utilize uh, tablets and phones and streaming devices at no charge. Um, and given the emphasis that we're in that's now on telehealth and social isolation from friends and family and future uses of technology, um, getting each apartment, which there are 120 units in this building, um, with its own Wi-Fi is a huge uh, game changer. And we're actually really excited about this. Um, next slide, please. Uh, so as I sort of wrap up, um, I wanted to briefly share that while we were sort of doing all these things and we were able to pivot our services and our operations to quickly adapt to this new COVID world, um, we also had to switch gears a bit during the months of May and June to actually fight for our adult health program not to be shut down and eliminated completely. Um, the Newsom administration had proposed to eliminate state funding for the current fiscal year that we're in uh, through Medi-Cal for all adult health centers um, throughout the state of California. So we had to work very quickly with our association, um, California Association for Adult Day Services, um, other adult health care providers throughout California and all of our state and local officials and representatives to ensure that our program was not eliminated. And on the link on this slide, um, you'll see for San Francisco Carnicle, one of our participants and their, their wife were able to um, be interviewed and contribute to an article that shared what from a, a caregiver's perspective, what it would mean without having adult day health care. Um, so although this whole process with having to fight for our program in the middle of 
you know, changing our, our operations and trying to care for our participants who are most at risk. Um, it added a, a crazy amount of stress and anxiety to an already stressful situation, but we fought hard and we prevailed and we are here to stay to keep providing care um, and services to our participants. Um, so thank you again for uh, giving me the opportunity to just kind of share what we've been doing over in Bayview and for our adult health care program and I'll turn it back over to uh, Ann. The organization that you're with has a, a wide array, uh, including the housing that you mentioned and nutrition and all the things. But could you say a little bit about the population of folks who um, who are part of the Adult Day Health Center? Yes. So within our organization, um, the Adult Day Health uh, participants are the most frail and vulnerable. Um, they are pretty much all would qualify to live in a skilled nursing facility, but the adult health program is an alternative to a long-term care in a facility. So uh, there can be a number of health issues related to um, COPD, uh, people who have had a stroke or do continue to have strokes. Um, we have a, a Alzheimer's or different forms of dementia um, and a lot of other uh, chronic health conditions. So we do serve uh, adults um, with disabilities as well as seniors, but our, our primary population is over the age, between the ages of about 60 to 90, actually. Right. And then we do have, our, our younger participants are probably in their 50s. Yeah, and just another follow-up question. How did you um, make the decision about who would get the grandparents? We, we wanted to know who would be able to learn the technology uh, because some you do typically need someone else in the home to help use it, like a caregiver or a family member if they're not familiar uh -huh. with the technology. And then also those who we really wanted to have our eyes on. So it's a great eyes on tool. Once we were able to learn them how to uh, teach them how to use it, um, we were able to then be able to follow up and call them so that we didn't necessarily have to go over to the home or rather our nurses go over to the home as much. Um, and then also we had some participants who didn't have any phone at all. Um, so giving them the grand pad really helped us to be able to at least call them and they've been able to answer. Um, so we had a few different uh, things that we use. We've, we've given them to some people and they haven't been successful at using it. Some people don't want it at all because they're sort of uh, paranoid about people being able to listen or look in on them, which is not the case at all. But for some of our participants, they're just, they're not interested in that technology. So even though people we may have really wanted to have it, they just don't want it. So we kind of find other ways to see if we can teach people how to use them. So there were a number of things. 